Welcome. This is Soothing Whispers ASMR. As always, if there are any sounds or words you would like to see me perform, please leave them below in the comments. Tonight, I thought we could enjoy some more of the short stories of George Luis Borges from his work of collected fictions. Beginning with The Widow Ching, Pirates. The author who uses the phrase female corsairs runs the risk of calling up an awkward image that of the now faded Spanish operetta with its theories of obvious servant girls playing the part of choreographed pirates on noticeably cardboard scenes. And yet there have been cases of female pirates, women skilled in the art of sailing, the governance of barbarous crews, the pursuit and looting of majestic ships, on the high seas. One such woman was Mary Reed, who was quoted once as saying that the profession of piracy wasn't for just anybody, and if you were going to practice it with dignity, you had to be a man of courage like herself. In the crude beginnings of her career, when she was not yet the captain of her own ship, a young man she fancied was insulted by the ship's bully. Mary herself picked a quarrel with the bully and fought him hand to hand in the old way of the Isles of the Caribbean, the long, narrow, and undependable breech loader in her left hand, the trusty saber in her right. The pistol failed her, but the saber acquitted itself admirably. In 1720, the bold career of Mary Reed was interrupted by a Spanish gallows in Santiago de la Vega on the island of Jamaica. Another female pirate of those waters was Anne Bonny, a magnificent Irish woman of high breasts and fiery hair who risked her life more than once in boarding ships. She stood on the deck with Mary Reed and then with her on the scaffold. Her lover, Captain John Rackham, met his own noose at that same hanging, and, contemptuous, emerged with that harsh variant on Axia's rebuke to Boyd Heel. If you'd fought like a man, you needn't have been hanged like a dog. Another woman pirate, but a more daring and long-lived one, plied the waters of far Asia from the Yellow Sea to the rivers on the borders of Anam. I am speaking of the doughty widow, Ching. The Years of Apprenticeship In 1797, the shareholders in the many pirate ships of the Yellow Sea formed a consortium, and they chose one Captain Ching, a just though strict man, tested under fire, to be the admiral of their new fleet. Ching was so harsh and exemplary in his sacking of the coasts that the terrified residents implored the emperor with gifts and tears to send them aid. Nor did their pitiable request fall upon deaf ears. They were ordered to set fire to their villages, abandon their fisheries, move inland, and learn the unknown science of agriculture. 
they did all this, and so finding only deserted coastlines, the frustrated invaders were forced into waylaying ships, a depredation far more unwelcome than raids on the coasts, for it seriously threatened the trade. Once again, the imperial government responded decisively. It ordered the former fishermen to abandon their plows and oxen and return to their oars and nets. At this, the peasants, recalling their former terrors, balked, so the authorities determined upon another course. They would make Admiral Ching the master of the royal stables. Ching was willing to accept the buy-off. The stockholders, however, learned of the decision in the nick of time, and their righteous indignation took the form of a plate of rice served up with poisoned greens. The delicacy proved fatal. The soul of that former admiral and newly appointed master of the royal stables was delivered up to the deities of the sea, his widow. Transfigured by the double treachery, called the pirates together, explained the complex case, and exhorted them to spurn both the emperor's deceitful clemency and the odious employment in the service of the shareholders with a bent for poison. She proposed what might be called freelance piracy. She also proposed that they cast votes for a new admiral, and she herself was elected. She was a sapling, thin woman of sleepy eyes and Carrie's riddled smile. Her oiled black hair shone brighter than her eyes. Under Miss Ching's calm command, the ships launched forth into danger and onto the high seas. The command... Thirteen years of methodical adventuring ensued. The fleet was composed of six squadrons, each under its own banner, red, yellow, green, black, purple, and one, the admiral's own, with the emblem of a serpent. The commanders of the squadrons had names such as Bird and Stone, Scourge of the Eastern Sea, Jewel of the Whole Crew, Wave of Many Fishes, and High Sun. The rules of the fleet, composed by the Widow Ching herself, were unappealable and severe and their measured, laconic style was devoid of those withered flowers of rhetoric that lend a ridiculous sort of majesty to the usual official pronouncement of the Chinese, an alarming example of which we shall encounter shortly. Here are some of the articles of the fleet's law. Not the least thing shall be taken privately from the stolen and plundered goods. All shall be registered, and the pirate receive for himself out of ten parts only two. Eight parts belong to the storehouse, called the general fund. Taking anything out of this general fund without permission shall be death. If any man goes privately on shore, or what is called transgressing the bars, he shall be taken and his ears perforated in the presence of the whole fleet, repeating the same, he shall suffer death. No person shall debauch at his pleasure captive women taken in the villages and open spaces and brought on board a ship. He must first request the ship's pursuer for permission and then go aside in the ship's hold. To use violence against any woman without permission of the pursuer shall be punished by death. Reports brought back by prisoners state that the mess on the pirate ships consisted mainly of hard tack, fattened rats, and cooked rice. On days of combat, the crew would mix gunpowder with their liquor. Marked cards and loaded dice, drinking and fan-tan, the visions of the opium pipe and little lamp filled idle hours. Two swords simultaneously employed were the weapon of choice. Before aboarding, the pirates would sprinkle their cheeks and bodies with garlic water, a sure charm against injury by fire breathed from muzzles. The crew of the ship traveled with their women, the captain with his harem, 
which might consist of five or six women and be renewed with each successive victory. The young Emperor Cheqing speaks. In June or July of 1809, an imperial decree was issued from which I translate the first paragraph and the last. Many people criticized its style. Miserable and injurious men, men who stamp upon bread, men who ignore the outcry of tax collectors and orphans, men whose small claws bear the figure of the phoenix and the dragon, men who deny the truth of printed books, men who let their tears flow facing north. Such men disturb the happiness of our rivers and the erstwhile trustworthiness of our seas. Day and night, their frail and crippled ships defy the tempest. Their object is not a benevolent one. They are not, and never have been, the seaman's bosom friend. Far from lending aid, they fall upon him with ferocity and make him an unwilling guest of ruin, mutilation, and even death. Thus these men violate the natural laws of the universe, and their offenses make rivers overflow their banks and flood the plains. Sons turn against their fathers, the principles of wetness and dryness exchange places. Therefore, I command thee to the punishment of these crimes, Admiral Kai Lang. Never forget, clemency is the emperor's to give. The emperor's subject would be presumptuous in granting it. Be cruel, be just, be obeyed, be victorious. The incidental reference to the crippled ships was, of course, a lie. Its purpose was to raise the courage of Kai Leng's expedition. Ninety days later, the forces of the widow Ching engaged the empires. Almost a thousand ships did battle from sunup to sundown. A mixed chorus of bells, drums, cannon bursts, curses, gongs, and prophecies accompanied the action. The emperor's the empire's fleet was destroyed. Admiral Kai Lang found the occasion to exercise neither the mercy forbidden him nor the cruelty to which he was extorted. He himself performed a ritual which our own defeated generals chose not to observe. He committed suicide. The terrified coastlines and riverbanks. Then the six hundred junks of war and the haughty widows, forty thousand victorious pirates, sailed into the mouth of the Zijang River, sowing fire and appalling celebration, and orphans left and right. Entire villages were raised. In one of them, the prisoners numbered more than a thousand. One hundred twenty women who fled to the pathless refuge of the nearby stands of reeds or the paddy fields were betrayed by the crying of a baby and sold into slavery in Macau. Though distant, the pathetic tears and cries of the mourning from these depredations came to the notice of Chai Ching, the son of heaven. Certain historians have allowed themselves to believe that the news of the ravaging of his people caused the emperor less pain than did the defeat of his punitive expedition. Be that as it may, the emperor organized a second expedition, terrible in banners, sailors, soldiers, implements of war, provisions, soothsayers, and astrologers. This time, the force was under the command of Admiral Ting Kai Hu. The heavy swarm of ships sailed into the mouth of the Zai Jing to cut off the pirate fleet. The widow rushed to prepare for battle. She knew it would be hard, very hard, almost desperate. Her men, after many nights and even months of pillaging and idleness, had grown soft. But the battle did not begin. The sun peacefully rose and without haste set again into the quivering reeds. The men and the arms watched and waited. The noon times were more powerful than they, and the siestas were infinite. The dragon and the vixen. 
and yet each evening lazy flocks of weightless dragons rose high into the sky above the ships of the imperial fleet and hovered delicately above the water, above the enemy docks. These comet-like kites were airy constructions of rice paper and reed, and each silvery or red body bore the identical characters. The widow anxiously studied that regular flight of meteors, and in it read the confused and slowly told fable of a dragon that had always watched over a vixen, in spite of the vixen's long ingratitude and constant crime. The moon grew thin in the sky, and still the figures of rice paper and a reed wrote the same story each evening with almost imperceptible variations. The widow was troubled, and she brooded. When the moon grew fat in the sky and in the red-tinged water, the story seemed to be reaching its end. No one could predict whether infinite pardon or infinite punishment was to be let fall upon the vixen, yet the inevitable end, whichever it might be, was surely approaching. The widow understood. She threw her two swords into the river, knelt in the bottom of a boat, and ordered that she be taken to the flagship of the emperor's fleet. It was evening. The sky was filled with dragons, this time yellow ones. The widow murmured a single sentence. The vixen seeks the dragon's wing as she stepped aboard the ship. The Apothesis The chroniclers report that the vixen obtained her pardon and that she dedicated her slow old age to opium smuggling. She was no longer the widow. She assumed a name that might be translated the luster of true instruction. Next up, we have the circular ruins. And if he left off to dreaming about you through the looking glass, six. No one saw him slip from the boat in the unanimous night. No one saw the bamboo canoe as it sank into the sacred mud. And yet within days, there was no one who did not know that the taciturn man had come there from the south and that his homeland was one of those infinite villages that lie upriver on the violent flank of the mountain where the language of the Zend is uncontaminated by Greek and where leprosy is uncommon. But in fact, the gray man had kissed the mud, scrambled up the steep bank without pushing back, probably without even feeling the sharp-leaved bulrushes that slashed his flesh, and dragged himself, faint and bloody, to the circular enclosure, crowned by the stone figure of a horse or tiger, which had once been the color of fire, but was now the color of ashes. That ring was a temple devoured by an ancient holocaust. Now the malarial jungle had profaned it, and its god went unhonored by mankind. The foreigner lay down at the foot of the pedestal. He was awakened by the sun high in the sky. He examined his wounds and saw, without astonishment, that they had healed. He closed his pale eyes and slept, not only out of any weakness of the flesh, but out of the willed determination. He knew that this temple was the place that his unconquerable plan called for. He knew that the unrelenting trees had not succeeded in strangling the ruins of another promising temple downriver, like this one, a temple to dead, incinerated gods. He knew that his immediate obligation was to sleep. 
About midnight, he was awakened by the inconsolable cry of a bird. Prints of unshod feet, a few figs, and a jug of water told him that the men of the region had respectfully spied upon his sleep, and that they sought his favor or feared his magic. He felt the coldness of fear, and he sought out a tomb-like niche in the crumbling wall where he covered himself with unknown leaves. The goal that led him on was not impossible, though it was clearly supernatural. He wanted to dream a man. He wanted to dream him completely, in painstaking detail, and impose him upon reality. This magical objective had come to fill his entire soul if someone had asked him his own name or inquired into any feature of his life till then, he would not have been able to answer. The uninhabited and crumbling temple suited him, for it was a minimum of visible wood. So did the proximity of the woodcutters, for they saw to his frugal needs. The rice and fruit of their tribute were nourishment enough for his body, which was conse consecrated to the sole task of sleeping and dreaming. At first, his dreams were chaotic. A little later, they became dialectical. The foreigner dreamed that he was in the corner of a circular amphitheater, which was somehow the ruined temple. Clouds of tacturn students completely filled the terraces of seats. The faces of those furthest away hung at many centuries' distance and at a cosmic height, yet they were absolutely clear. The man lectured on anatomy, on anatomy cosmic cosmography, magic, the faces listened earnestly, intently, and attempted to respond with understanding, as though they sensed the importance of that education that would redeem one of them from his state of hollow appearance and insert him into the real world. The man, both in sleep and when awake, pondered his phantasm's answers. He did not allow himself to be taken in by impostors, and he sensed in certain perplexities a growing intelligence. He was seeking a soul worthy of taking its place in the universe. On the ninth or tenth night, he realized with some bitterness that nothing could be expected from those students who passively accepted his teachings, but only from those who might occasionally, in a reasonable way, venture an objection. The first, the accepting, though worthy of affection and a degree of sympathy, would never emerge as individuals. The latter, those who sometimes questioned, had a bit more pre-existence. One afternoon, afternoons now paid their tribute to sleep as well. Now the man was awake no more than two or three hours around daybreak. He, he dismissed the vast illusory classroom once and for all and retained but a single pupil, a tacturn, sallow-skinned young man, at times intractable, with sharp features that echoed those of the man that dreamed him. The pupil was not disconcerted for long by the elimination of his classmates. After only a few of the private classes, his progress amazed his teacher, yet disaster would not be forestalled. One day the man emerged from sleep as though from a vicious desert, looked up at the hollow light of the evening, which for a moment he confused with the light of dawn, and realized that he had not dreamed. All that night and the next day, the unbearable lucidity of insomnia harried him like a hawk. He went off to explore the jungle, hoping to tire himself. Among the hemlocks, he managed no more than a few intervals of feeble sleep, fleetingly veined with the most rudimentary of visions, useless to him. He reconvened his class, but no sooner had he spoken a few brief words of exhortation than the faces blurred, twisted, and faded away. 
in his almost perpetual state of wakefulness, tears of anger burned the man's old eyes. He understood that the task of molding the incoherent and dizzying stuff that dreams are made of is the most difficult work a man can undertake, even if he fathom all the enigmas of the higher and lower sphere much more difficult than weaving a rope of sand or minting coins of the faceless wind. He understood that initial failure was inevitable. He swore to put behind him the vast hallucination that at first had drawn him off the track, and he sought another way to approach his task. Before he began, he devoted a month to recovering the strength his delirium had squandered. He abandoned all premeditation of dreaming and almost instantly managed to sleep for a fair portion of the day. The few times he did dream during this period, he did not focus on his dreams. He would wait to take up his task again until the disk of the moon was whole. Then, that evening, he purified himself in the waters of the river, bowed down to the planetary gods, uttered those syllables of a powerful name that it is lawful to pronounce, and laid himself down to sleep. Almost immediately, he dreamed a beating heart. He dreamed the heart warm, active, secret, about the size of a closed fist, a garnet-covered thing inside the dimness of a human body that was still faceless and sexless. He dreamed it with painstaking love for fourteen brilliant nights. Each night he perceived it with greater clarity, greater certainty. He did not touch it. He only whisked witnessed it, observed it, corrected it, perhaps, with his eyes. He perceived it, he lived it, from many angles, many distances. On the fourteenth night, he stroked the pulmonary artery with his forefinger, then the entire heart, inside and out, and his inspection made him proud. He deliberately did not sleep the next night. Then he took up the heart again, invoked the name of a planet, and set about dreaming another of the major organs. Before the year was out, he had reached the skeleton, the eyelids, the countless hairs of the body, or perhaps the most difficult task. The man had dreamed, a fully fleshed man, a stripling, but this youth did not stand up or speak, nor could it open its eyes. Night after night, the man dreamed the youth asleep. In the cos cosmognophies of the Gnostics, the demiurges need up a red atom who cannot manage to stand, as rude and inept as, and elementary as that atom of dust was, the atom of dream wrought from the sorcerer's nights. One afternoon, the man almost destroyed his creation, but he could not bring himself to do it. He'd have been better off if he had. After making vows to all the deities of the earth and the river, he threw himself at the feet of the idol that was perhaps a tiger or perhaps a colt, and he begged for its untried aid. That evening, at sunset, the statue filled his dream. In the dream it was alive and trembling, yet it was not the dread-inspiring hybrid form of a horse and tiger it had been. It was, instead, those two vehement creatures, plus bull and rose and tempest, too, and all that simultaneously. The manifold god revealed to the man that its earthly name was fire, and that in that circular temple, and others like it, Men had made sacrifices and worshipped it, that it would magically bring to life the phantasm the man had dreamed, so fully bring him to life that every creature, save fire itself and the man who dreamed him, would take him for a man of flesh and blood. Fire ordered the dreamer to send the youth, once instructed in the rites, to that other ruined temple whose pyramid still stood downriver so that a voice might glorify the god in that deserted place. In the dreaming man's dream, the 
the dreamed man awoke. The sorcerer carried out fire's instructions. He consecrated a period of time, which in the end encompassed two full years, to revealing to the, to the youth the arcana of the universe and the secrets of the cult of fire. Deep inside, it grieved the man to separate himself from his creation. Under the pretext of pedagogical necessity, he drew out the hours of sleep more every day. He also redid the right shoulder, which was perhaps defective from time to time. He was disturbed by a sense that all this had happened before. His days were, in general, happy. When he closed his eyes, he would think, now I will be with my son, or less frequently. The son I have engendered is waiting for me, and he will not exist if I do not go to him. Gradually, the man accustomed the youth to reality. Once he ordered him to set a flag on a distant mountaintop, the next day the flag crackled on the summit. He attempted other similar experiments, each more daring than the last. He saw with some bitterness that his son was ready, perhaps even impatient, to be born. That night he kissed him for the first time, then sent him off through many leagues of impenetrable jungle, many leagues of swamp, to that other temple whose ruins bleached in the sun downstream. But first, so that the sun would never know that he was a phantasm, so that he would believe himself to be a man like other men, the man infused in him a total lack of memory of his years of education. The man's victory and his peace were dulled by the wearisome sameness of his days. In the twilight hours of dusk and dawn, he would prostrate himself before the stone figure, imagining perhaps that his unreal son performed identical rites and other circular ruins downstream. At night he did not dream, or dreamed the dreams that all men dream. His perceptions of the universe's sounds and shapes were somewhat pale. The absent sun was nourished by these diminutions of his soul. His life's goal had been accomplished. The man now lived on in a sort of ecstasy. After a period of time, which some tellers of the story choose to compute in years, others in decades, two rowers woke the man at midnight. He could not see their faces, but they told him of a magical man in a temple in the north, a man who could walk on fire and not be burned. The sorcerer suddenly remembered the god's words. He remembered that of all the creatures on the earth, fire was the only one who knew that his son was a phantasm. That recollection, comforting at first, soon came to torment him. He feared that his son would mediate upon his unnatural privilege and somehow discover that he was a mere simulacrum. To be not a man, but the projection of another man's dream. What incomparable humiliation, what vertigo. Every parent feels concern for the children he has procreated or allowed to be procreated, in happiness or in mere confusion. It was only natural that the sorcerer should fear for the future of the son he had conceived organ by organ, feature by feature, through a thousand and one secret nights. The end of his meditations came suddenly, but it had been foretold by certain signs. First, after a long drought, a distant cloud as light as a bird upon a mountain top. Then, toward the south, the sky the pinkish color of a leopard's gums, and the clouds of smoke that rusted the iron of the nights. Then, at last, the panic flight of the animals, for that which had occurred hundreds of years ago was being repeated now. The ruins of the sanctuary of the god of fire were destroyed by fire. In the birdless dawn, the sorcerer watched the concentric holocaust close in upon the walls. For a moment he thought of taking refuge in the water, but then he realized that death would be a crown upon his age and absolve him from his labors. He walked into the tatters of flame, but they did not bite his flesh. They caressed him, bathed him, 
without heat and without combustion. With relief, with humiliation, with terror, he realized that he too was but an appearance, that another man was dreaming him. And with that, we have come to the end of our video. As always, I wish you a wonderful day and a wonderful night. Sweet dreams.